For those of you listening who are professional brewers, I'm here to tell you that planning brew schedules just got easier. Starting now, Imperial Yeast guarantees that commercial orders up to 20 liters of three of their most popular strains will ship free if they're not in stock when you place your order. So in addition to pitching right with the highest quality yeast on the market, they're promising that yeast will be ready when you need it or shipping is on them. A rad deal from a rad company. Whether you're a pro or a home brewer, if you haven't tried Imperial Yeast in your brewery yet, it's time to up your game. You can check out everything Imperial Yeast has to offer and place your commercial orders at imperialyeast.com. The first big step in the brewing process involves steeping malt in hot water in a process referred to as mashing, during which endogenous enzymes are activated uh, that convert starch into sugar that's capable of then being metabolized by yeast during fermentation. Now, this sugar is fairly complex and can pose some issues when brewing certain styles. You're listening to the Brewlosophy Podcast. I'm your host, Marshall Schott. And in this episode, contributor Brian Hall's with me to talk about supplementing simple sugar for a portion of malt. We're going to talk today about supplementing that sugar in a specific style, and that is a Belgian triple. We're going to look a little deeper than we usually do into this experiment, and we're going to talk about how we um, added sugar into one beer and left the other one as all malt, and what differences, tasters, if any, they got. Yeah, there's all kinds of uh, kind of, um, I don't want to say theories necessarily, but but people have these concerns, I should say, uh, with, you know, replacing a portion of the malt with sugar and what that can lead to. Uh, it's also a completely normal part of certain styles like triple uh, and, and many other Belgian styles. So that's going to be what we're going to be focusing on. Now, if this topic feels a little bit familiar, it's probably because we're sort of rehashing something we covered previously. Episode 41, which came out back in May, was all about using sugar in the brewing process. Go back and listen to that show if you want to kind of dig a little bit deeper just into the general uh, side of using sugar and brewing. Uh, but when we started Brewlosophy uh, a couple years, well, the Brewlosophy podcast a couple years ago, we had a bucket of po- topics to choose from since we'd completed so many experiments beforehand, usually combining uh, a few experiments per episode. Well, here we are at episode 74, and that list of completed variables is starting to thin out a little bit. So we put our heads together and came up with an idea that we think will keep the show fresh and uh, going for as long as we're around. For those of you who might not be aware, we publish one experiment article every single week at brewlosophy.com. They come out every Monday morning. In fact, we're fast approaching our 300th experiment. That's on top of all of the other stuff we publish every Thursday. 300 experiments. Pretty nuts when I start to think about it. Uh, Anyway, our thought was to adapt this show to being a little bit more focused. And by focused, I just mean we'll be digging in a little deeper into specific variables that we've tested rather than doing the more general overview. Uh, We kind of have done that about pretty much everything at this point. Another cool thing this is going to allow us to do is address reader comments about specific experiments right here on the show. Uh, Every time we publish, we receive a ton of awesome feedback, valid critiques, uh, interesting questions, all that kind of stuff. Now, rather than just typing out a response on the article or on social media, we're going to give you our thoughts in each episode as well. I think it's going to be cool uh, and allow us to continue providing you with all this nerdy brewing science content that we have been doing. Uh, As always, if you have any feedback about this shift, good, bad, ugly, uh, go ahead and let us know. You can uh, shoot us an uh, email at marshall at brewlosophy.com or feedback at brewlosophy.com. All right, I've been talking up the Brew Your Own Boot Camp in Asheville, North Carolina that's coming up in March quite a bit lately, and that's because we really would love to see you all there. And by we, I'm referring to Denny Kahn, Drew Beecham, potentially Malcolm Fraser, and myself. As with most good things, this event does come at a cost, but if you register before January 22nd, that's like a week and a half from now, You'll save $100 off uh, the cost of registration, and you can get an additional $25 off by using the discount code BYO Bootcamp Brulosophy. That's BYO Bootcamp Brulosophy, all one string. Seriously, if you're on the fence, consider this me pushing you over. Go register now, save some dough, and come have a rad time with us in Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, coming up next week, 2012 Homebrewer of the Year, Annie Johnson is going to be sitting down with patrons of Brulosophy to answer a bunch of questions. In addition to being an incredible brewer, Annie also works for Pico Brew and is just an all-around fun person. Uh, In February, our guest will be the alchemist John Kimmich, and we've got more killer guests lined up for the rest of the year. To get in on this action or to learn more about how you can receive killer rewards uh, like unique Yakima Valley hops discounts and never-before-published recipes, in exchange for helping us bring you this show, head over to patreon.com slash brewlosophy 
Uh, and huge ups to everyone who's been using the links at brewlosophy.com slash support when doing your online shopping. It helps more than you know. All right, we've got some feedback, which is brought to you by Brewers Hardware, who not only make gorgeous stainless brewing rigs like the turnkey BH-15 pilot system, but they offer fully customizable options and a whole host of unique purpose-built products as well. If you've been looking to upgrade your brewery, perhaps build out an electric system or pick up some quality stainless parts, give brewershardware.com a look. Uh, They've got it all. And when you mention you heard about them on the Brewlosophy podcast, they'll throw in a free gift as well. That's brewershardware.com. So there are often times when we're planning an episode where I feel, uh, I guess, a little less than intelligent about the subject matter, and I usually defer to my much smarter co-host. Brian, that's you in this show. <laughs> uh, I was going to say, you're, no, where you are, headed? Where trust me, headed? you're smarter than me. I'm a good faker. But last week, uh, we talked about enzymes, and that was you were on that show, uh, Brian, a subject that I feel like I have a kind of a fairly decent practical grasp of, but I'm certainly not an expert on. Well, one of our awesome listeners named Matt, he shot me an email uh, with a few corrections and some insights about enzymes. Uh, And I I figured I'd share it with our listeners because I do think it's really interesting. He says, first, a protein always has a very specific three-dimensional structure that's necessary for it to be functional. This protein can change shape depending on the condition. We call it denaturing when it becomes inactive or renaturing when it becomes active. However, the permanence of this denaturing is dependent on how much the protein was denatured. Some proteins can renature back to the original condition. And he says, for the nerds, this involves the secondary and tertiary structure. Uh, He goes on to say that a protein has optimal conditions that are required for it to be activated. The literature tends to focus on pH, temperature, salinity, and pressure. This is dependent on the organism and where it lives. Uh, Think of those thermal vent organisms that live at high pressure, acidic, saline, and hotter than boiling water conditions. Of course, all of these can be relevant to the brewer. Strangely, the type of salt can affect the stability of the protein as well. Uh, He says that he's read that calcium chloride has a negative impact on the stability of a protein. So he adds calcium chlorine uh, chloride to the boil kettle and not to the mash because he doesn't want it to affect his mash efficiency, which I think is really interesting. He says he's never tested the effect of calcium chloride on the mash, but he hasn't had any negative uh, experiences yet doing it by adding it to the kettle. Uh, Brian, you have any thoughts on this? I thought this was pretty interesting feedback. (laughs) <laughs> you know, I was going to bring all that up last time, but I just i i hadn't i hadn't really gotten that far. It it makes sense listening to it, but yeah, it is totally above my my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and that's the thing about brewing that I think is really cool is that um, you can have a really practical, pragmatic grasp of how the process works and still produce fantastic beer just by doing the right things. Uh, but sometimes it's fun to just go down these wormholes, you know, and 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 learn more about how how the stuff works and why it's doing what it's doing. So for that, Matt, I really do appreciate the feedback. Uh, we've got a lot more on the um, the enzyme show. I got God, I got a lot of emails about that one, and it wasn't mean. I mean, it was people who just wanted to clarify well, stuff. And thanks to all of them for doing that, because there's often times that uh, you know just somebody that can explain something so much better than you or I or a textbook can. Um, you know, somebody with all that experience, like. Matt's explanation makes total sense to me now that I hear it, but yeah. it would probably take me hours of sifting through making notes and that sort of thing to really come up with an explanation that that I can visualize as well. Yeah, yeah, no, it's absolutely true. So we always appreciate feedback like that, and uh, and uh, you know we're we're learning as we go as well. So if you have show feedback, you can send it to feedback at brewlosophy dot com, or you can even leave us a voice message by calling nine five one four 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 zero three two zero. Every autumn, brewers all over start making pumpkin beers, usually going with a darker base style. Uh, I've tried a good number of these beers, and to this day, I'm just not a huge fan. I've never had one where I thought, man, I wish I could have more of that. But you haven't had a hazy pumpkin beer, Oh, Lord. So (laughs) that basically, pumpkin pie blended with a little bit of Miller Lite or something, right? There you you go. There you go. (laughs) Well, (laughs) listener Chuck Eichert made a pumpkin porter he thought turned out pretty good and sent me some to taste. One minute beer review with Jersey and Tim. Ah, it's dark. It's very dark. Uh, it's a stout. Just, just by looking, huh? Oh, let me guess. What? Don't taste it. Let me guess. Oatmeal and coffee. Go. Nailed it. Okay. Well, You're, no need done. to drink this. No need to drink it. No need to drink this beer. That's good. I don't know if I like the initial taste. I, I, I don't mind it. It's, it's growing on me, but the first one was like, ooh. Yeah. Which is weird because I've already been drinking so much that I should be ready. I, I don't know. It's got. It's growing on me. I don't know what it is. And you know what it is. Oatmeal stout. No, not an oatmeal stout. Don't don't call it an oatmeal stout. Just say it tastes like oatmeal. Haven't we learned enough? You never commit to anything. 
Yeah, I don't, dude, I don't, like, it doesn't taste like the first taste that I tasted. I couldn't drink a whole lot of it. It might be like a porter. I'm with you there. Could you put a lump of ice cream in it? Look at this. Look at Jersey Go. Yeah, it might be a porter. I mean, it's good. There's not a whole lot of flavor, which is good. It has like a, at the right, right at the beginning, like a. Yeah, it's like like a a weird. Tart. Oh, good descriptor. It's like somebody gave you a list of descriptors. I just didn't know what it, like, it's got this weird thing at the beginning. You're like, tart. I'm like, yes. Anyway, that's all I got. Pumpkin pie? Who wants pie? It tastes heavy. Yeah. Very heavy. <sighs> it's it's not bad though. No, I, but but I, I could like I could not drink a whole bunch of it. If I was gonna name it, I would name it Decaying Orbit. There you go. For the style it represents, I think it does a pretty good job, you know. Uh, I'd and give what it that? seven. You know, the style that it is. <laughs> it's really good at. So I give it sevens. All right. I'll, I'll go with five. I mean I enjoy it. It's good. Yeah. Very very complex. We say that every once in a while. It makes it sound good. Ooh. It's complex. So honestly, this was probably one of the best pumpkin beers I've had, but only because, like the guy said, uh, it really tasted mostly like a standard porter. Uh, the spice character that usually overwhelms these types of beers for me was really subtle. And while I probably would have liked the beer even more if it wasn't there at all, it was good enough that I drank the whole sample. Brian, I, you know, it's, it wasn't hazy, but uh, you getting the whole pumpkin beer thing. <laughs> I used to be into the whole pumpkin beer thing, and then I found that no matter how I did a pumpkin, it uh, or how I did a pumpkin, how I it, how I put a pumpkin into my beer, it never tasted like pumpkin. And then so I tried eating pumpkin straight up, and oh, it doesn't really have a flavor, so I stopped putting it in my beer. I think there's a certain maybe a viscosity change that you can get from adding pumpkin um, that might need more research from somebody like Malcolm or Phil, right? <laughs> right. Um, but. Uh, you know, if I want some of that flavor, I can I can just spice it and I get something something similar. But the, you know, there's enough pumpkin beer floating around. Everybody wants to brew one. I usually just try everybody else's and rag on them, then make my own. Yeah. At this point, it's it's such a mess to make a pumpkin beer if you're really using pumpkin. I agree, and and I think a lot of people these days are moving more toward the kind of spiced beer as opposed to adding actual pumpkin. I, I think it was Malcolm who was explaining to me that acetaldehyde actually a common descriptor for that is is like raw squash, raw pumpkin. So yeah, um, yeah by adding that i've had beers that have pumpkin in it and i that doesn't taste like acetaldehyde i just don't think the the flavor carries through very well but uh chucks honestly the the porter was great um the spices that were in there were were subtle enough that i could drink the whole sample so for that uh thank you i i can say that i like a pumpkin beer Uh, if you have a beer that you would like reviewed by jersey and tim on the show you can email me marshall at brewlosophy.com and we will get you all set up all right we'll be right back As every brewer knows, the best beer requires the best hops, which Yakima Valley Hops provides fresh from the source to brewers around the world, carrying everything from classics like Cascade to modern favorites like Galaxy and Mosaic, as well as other ingredients and gear, Yakima Valley Hops has it all. And don't forget to check out their new podcast, The Late Edition, where the YVH crew goes into depth on our favorite plant with industry experts. Head over to yakimavalleyhops.com now to see all they have to offer and subscribe to The Late Edition wherever it is you listen to podcasts. After a long brew day, the last thing I want to do is waste more time chilling wort. I've tried so many different options, and ultimately I settled on the super efficient immersion chillers made by Jaded Brewing. With the King Cobra and Hydra, I'm able to chill my entire batch of wort, from boiling to just a few degrees above groundwater temperature, in as little as six minutes. If an immersion chiller is right for your brewery, then do yourself a favor and check out all of the rad options Jaded Brewing has to offer at jadedbrewing.com. And be sure to let them know Brewlosophy sent you. Hi, I'm Stephen Leach, creator of Brow Supply Brewing Systems, here to tell you about our latest Unibrow Brewing System. Modeled after the brew in a bag method, the Unibrow uses the same kettle for both mashing and boiling, replacing the fabric bag with a stainless basket that can hold up to 20 pounds of grain. A heating element is run by an electric controller that allows for the maintenance of specific mash temperatures and makes mashing easier than ever. Each Unibrow is shipped with a counterflow chiller and the parts required to brew a batch of beer. We're really proud of the Unibrow, and we know you'll love it as much as we do. Go check it out at BrowSupply.com and sign up for our email list to receive special deals in your inbox. 
Family owned Atlantic Brew Supplies, the largest homebrew shop in the Southeast. No gimmicks, no multinational corporate overlords, and no BS. They offer exclusive malts, yeast, and more from local artisans, as well as award winning recipe kits. They also sell professional brewing gear and cask equipment from sister companies ABS Commercial and Cask Supply. Most ingredients are available by the ounce, plus, Atlantic Brew Supply has an on site calculator to help you craft your best brew. Orders are processed same day, and two day shipping is guaranteed for East Coast customers. Get 15% off your first order using promo code. Code BrewPod. That's B R U P O D at AtlanticBrewSupply.com. While certain types of sugars are naturally present in work, uh, there are a few reasons brewers might choose to swap out some of their grain with something a little simpler. Yeah, there's a couple different reasons that most people use sugar, in my mind at least, and that's either to raise the alcohol level without increasing the body of the beer. Or if we're going to kind of uh, kind of the same the same idea, but it is to lighten the body of the beer while keeping the same alcohol level. Right. Um, you know, you, we can also have we also have a whole bunch of different types of sugars that you guys went over pretty thoroughly in episode forty one, and you know that's talking about adding different flavors. Um, you know, we add sugars to carbonate, um, and then oftentimes, and you know, especially back in the day, it was just a lot cheaper to use uh, something like cane sugar instead of buying more malt, malt extract. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I remember um, b- this was before my my time in brewing. At least the first kit that I got wasn't like this. But I've heard stories from numerous people that uh, got into home brewing maybe in the 70s and 80s who would go and get a can of extract, which is basically sugar, but it's the malt sugar. It's maltose. Uh, and But along with that came like a, a charger pack or something like that, right? Um, right. And, and all that basically was is uh, dextrose, which is corn sugar, uh, to boost up the fermentability and get your alcohol to the proper level uh, without having to use, you know, I guess more malt extract, which is a little bit, quite a bit more expensive. Yeah, I've got a, I've actually got a copy here of the Alaskan Bootleggers Bible, which is published some years ago. And it, it goes over a lot of um, simple ways to get loaded, essentially. And, you know, they've got this, <laughs> this recipe for the Alaskan bush beer, or which is a prohibition style beer called Sneaky Pete. Uh, this out of the book and if you ha- own that book it's on page 58 <laughs> um, and, and the recipe is three three pounds of uh, a three pound can of blue ribbon malt syrup that is hop flavored four pounds of cane sugar five gallons of water and one package of baker's yeast there you go uh yeah that definitely sounds I mean, like a bootleggers beer yeah i made it. it it was one of the first recipes i made and it was not entirely pleasant i didn't use baker's yeast but yeah it wasn't great that seems to me like the type of beer that you would you would like after maybe three pints of it, you'd start to think that it was OK. And if I when I think of big hairy guys like you out in the Alaskan bush, that's exactly <laughs> what I expect them to be drinking is something that's like, you know, takes a takes some gusto to really get through a pint of it. <laughs> Yeah, I think we felt pretty macho. We were living in some old cab with, you know, moose skull over the top sort of thing. And we we're <laughs> yeah. 40 degrees inside, heating it with some aquarium sort of thing. And, you know, it's just, you're just getting there. So I think, I think that's, you know, originally sugar was just, it's a cheap, easy way to get more alcohol. And it, and it still is. I mean, it's, it's, if you want to bump your alcohol up of a, of, of some beer that you're just wanting to be stronger and maybe, you know, you know, too thick, um, just adding some, adding some sugar towards the last 10 minutes of your boil can just give you that little extra boost. And as we've shown in a couple of our experiments, you know, people can't always detect that little extra percent. So, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and so we mentioned different types of, uh, of sugars that are used in brewing. Um, and some of them are, are, are said to impart some flavor. I think a lot of people really dr- truly believe that it does uh, leave behind some residual flavor. Uh, I got to be honest, I've used different types of sugar in both cider and beer. And in my experience, the flavor doesn't seem to come through as strongly as uh, I would have expected. So you've got your typical table sugar, which is uh, primarily sucrose, I believe. Am, am I yep, that's right correct. about that? So you got your table sugar. Uh, uh, that's the stuff you put in your coffee or on your Cheerios or whatever. Uh, you got corn sugar, which is what I think most people refer to in homebrewing as priming sugar. Uh, that, But those can be swapped. We haven't done a test on that yet, but you can use either of those to carbonate your beer as well. And then, of course, you got the different levels of brown sugar. You got honey, maple syrup, uh, all, turbinado sugar, all kinds of these different sugars that when you taste them on their own, taste different. Um, you know, if you make a mead, you're going to taste honey. 
And I get that because because it is it is a, it's fermented honey. That's all it is. But when you add uh, maybe a pound of of honey to a say honey blonde ale, in my experience, I really don't get a very strong honey flavor from that. Um, same thing. I've used brown sugar in a brown ale. Uh, my brother and I uh, made this brown ale. Kind of came up with this brown ale recipe together, and it just didn't the it didn't have that sweet kind of caramelly flavor that I expected from uh, the brown sugar. And it got to, got me to thinking that the amount maybe that that was used Use just wasn't enough to, to go be, to do anything more beyond what you expect in terms of fermentability from adding sugar. Yeah, I think it kind of just depends on the quantity you're adding, the beer that you're adding it to. Um, I recently, well, I shouldn't say recently, la- I'm recently drinking it, but a year ago I made a imperial stout and I added three pounds of maple syrup to a uh, five gallon batch, and I, I I don't get any maple out of it at all. Um, it's definitely a strong, a much stronger beer. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not getting a lot of maple where I, and I made another, I actually made a, uh, a 10 gallon batch and, and half of it got maple, sh- maple syrup. The other half just got table sugar, um, during high fermentation. So, um, you know, I, I can't tell the difference between the two at all. And I know what the difference is. That's, that's crazy that three pounds of maple syrup wouldn't come through in the flavor. Uh, it leads me to think that in brewing, uh, that the, you know, to kind of refocus this, I, you know, our, not refocus. I think most people do use it to bump up their OG um, and have a very easily, you know, metabolized uh, uh, carbohydrate source for the yeast. Um, but but this idea of imparting flavor to beer. I made a the very first cider I ever made had like two or three pounds of brown sugar in it as well. Um, and it man, I'll tell you what it that it got there was a lot of alcohol in it. Um, but I did not taste the brown sugar at all. It just seemed to me like a really boozy apple juice. Yeah, sugar really definitely can give the, a little bit of a boozier taste. Um, completely anec- anecdotally, obviously, I haven't done any experiments on this, but I have found that adding sugar, um, you know, especially if you're adding high amounts of sugar, adding that to the uh, the beer while it's fermenting um, tends to lend it to have a, a less a less boozy character. So doing multiple sugar additions, and we may or may not have something coming up where we talk a little bit more about that um, in one of our experiments. <laughs> uh, but yeah, just anecdotes. I mean, we've been we uh, we recently brewed a uh, a very large batch. We did eighty gallons of what was going to be a barley wine and kind of just turned into a strong ale. And um, with the malt, we had a you know a potential alcohol of about eleven percent. Um, I'm not sure what the OG is off the top of my head. I just remember me throwing around all these high ABV numbers and <laughs> we, we, uh, we essentially just made invert syrup, which is just heating sugar up to a, a certain temperature and adding a little bit of acid to it. Um, and then letting it, you know, caramelize a little bit. And we added that during fermentation twice, I believe it was twice. And we ended up with a fairly respectable 15% beer. Um, and it, it drinks like a smooth, like seven, eight percent triple. It just has that. It has that smoothness and balance to it. It reminds me of a triple without the Belgian yeast. So huh. you ne- you never know that you're drinking something that strong. So I do think I think it'd be fun to experiment a little more with with sugar additions and that boozy perception. Because a lot of people do say, I, you know, I add sugar and now it tastes really alcoholic or it tastes really boozy. And I wonder if it's just you know how how it is that you're using it. Either that or uh, it could just be a function of the amount of sugar that we're using. Because I, I think, uh, you know, in the, in the experiment we're going to talk about in a bit that you did, I think you just swapped out 10% of your grist with the sugar, which, you know, that's that equates to maybe a pound or so of sugar. Uh, when you're getting up into the two, three, four pound range, I mean, you're essentially making pruno, like a, like a tasty version of prison pruno is, is how I look at it. Um, and, and there's, you know, alcohol has that kind of, um, flavor and and uh, uh, kind of burn when you when you drink it, and the more that's there, the more you're going to experience that. In my mind, at least, uh, is how it works. So you mentioned this uh, the couple of different ways of using sugar in brewing, um, and I think the two most common that I can think of. I don't know anybody who's tossing sugar into the mash, uh, but the two most common that yeah. I know are adding uh, sugar. So basically, what you're doing is you're gonna you're gonna take away some of the in, you know based on what we're talking about here. You're gonna you're gonna replace a portion, typically 10 to 15, maybe 20% of your malt uh, with 
simple sugar, which is going to boost up your ABV and make that uh, wort a bit more hmm, appealing to the yeast. It's going to be able to work through it a bit easier because those sugars are so simple. They're less complex than maltose, uh, is my understanding. And uh, the other way that, that sugar is often used, like, like you said, Brian, is to, is to add it to the uh, fermentation vessel during fermentation. We do have an experiment that Malcolm did on staggered sugar additions as well uh, that I think is really interesting. Um, and uh, it just depends on you know what I guess your approach and what what you're thinking the argument my understanding about adding it to the fermenter doesn't so much have to do with directly at least uh, flavor profile and whatnot as much as it does yeast health uh, you know you start that yeast off in wort of lower OG and then as it starts to chomp down that OG uh, you, you give it something else to eat so it doesn't uh, overwork itself basically Right. That's the, that's the same understanding that I have. I'm, I'm sure again that somebody out there could probably explain it a little better than, than I could a little more scientifically, but yeah, it's it kind of, the yeast is kind of continually working and you're keeping that OG, um, you know, a kind of in the same zone as, as well as the alcohol level slowly increases. So yeah, yeah, I think, I think I, and you mentioned, you know, adding sugars for the yeast, yeast to munch on, munch on and, and it, it does, it does depend which kind of sugar you are adding because yeast, you know, they do, they do require, uh, what is it, in, in, invertase, I believe the enzyme to take sucrose and break it into glucose and fructose. I, I believe that's what it is. Yeah. yeah. Invertase. Yeah. Whereas, you know, if you add something like straight up corn sugar, um, you know, that's already a simple sugar or, you know, you could, you could take the sucrose and you could invert it, you know, in a syrup and then it would, all, it would break itself down into glucose and fructose as well. Right. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. There's a, there's a whole bunch of different ways to do it. Um, I find the easiest is, as, is at the end of the boil if it, or during, or during, uh, fermentation. Um, but there's several different reasons, you know, we mentioned, we talked about, we talked about why we might, might might want to do this and, and one term that people like to throw around a lot and you kind of just touched on this when we talked about the experiment is replacing that little bit of malt with some sugar and they use the term because they want to dry out the beer yeah <laughs> right we see this a lot in in, in imperial ipas and i think i think it was a, a episode or not episode it was q a number five we had a great question about this and they said what do you mean by drying out a beer and so we talked a little bit about that. And essentially what we're doing is because we are replacing some of that uh, malt that may not, that might not ferment completely and contributing a little bit to some of those FG points with sugar, which will not contribute to any FG points, but still having higher alcohol, right, we're right. getting a slightly lower FG. We're also getting a slightly lower FG because we've got more alcohol in solution. Alcohol specific gravity is simply lower as well. So there's that, there's that, um, you know, that perceptual dryness that you would get from having, having that lower FG as well. Right, right. And this is, you know, the, the idea behind dryness. I, you know, when we, when, when somebody uses the term dry to de describe an alcoholic beverage, whether that's wine or beer or champagne or whatever it might be, uh, typically it, it, you know, the kind of the more measurable objective thing is, is low FG. So you've, you know, you got to like kind of objectively dry by measurement, but I think perceptually it's come to mean crisp, clean, uh, maybe more on the thin side. I don't want to say thin, like in the negative negative way, uh, but, but that really nice, just, just, um, crisp, clean, you know, you think of styles like American light lager, um, which I think is interesting. Actually, you've got these people who, you know, you got this style that's kind of known for being made with corn, uh, flaked maize. If you're doing it on the home brewing scale is usually included or cream ales, another one. Um, well, one thing that you can do is rather than using the corn to try to extract the sugar from that flaked corn is just toss in some dextrose. That's basically what you're trying to extract. Extract uh, from the uh, you know from that flake maze anyways, and so some people I've seen these recipes that have a good portion of uh, dextrose or corn sugar included uh, in the recipe rather than using corn in general. And and my understanding is that most of the big breweries who are making these very consistently <clears throat> delicious um, light lagers <laughs> uh, that they're most of them are using a corn syrup. And I know that man corn syrup has gotten like a bad rap lately, but I'm not a hater, and uh, you know you can. Take something like a, a straight corn syrup. Don't use caro because I think they put vanilla in theirs. But um, you know something like that, and swap out the the flaked maize or whatever it is. Or you can use these different types of sugars. You know, again, uh, as a replacement for some malt to lighten up that body and to while at the same time increasing the alcohol level, which is exactly what uh, Belgian ales are known for. Right. So. 
you know, we've got in Belgian ales, we've got double, triple, um, quad. And I, I believe that term originally started from the idea that they were using double the amount of malt as an original, as a basic Trappist ale, and then triple the amount of malt and quadruple the amount of malt. Um, but you know, that might be a tall tale, like the whole shipping IPA with hops to preserve it and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> um, but you know, the trip, the idea is they're using a little more malt, but you know, you, you still want a triple should still be bright yellow, um, or, or, you know, lightly golden in color, a little bit, a little bit darker than, than a Pilsner. And, you know, you're, you're looking for that classical Belgian yeast, those Belgian yeast flavors, but it should be exceptionally drinkable. I and mean, right. it's the most, it's the most popular Belgian beer that is brewed in America. Um, I don't know about Belgian stats, but it does come, you know, you, you do have a much lighter body than some of the other Belgian ales. I, th- I think I almost think that triples come across as lighter in body than doubles do personally. No, I do too. Um, yeah. That's been I, my experience. I, I think part of that is in, in, you know, the, most of the classic recipes, um, you know, they, they include 10, 10 to 15% uh, sugar. Right. Well, and, and you look at the type of sugar that they tend to include. Um, Belgians are known for candy syrup, of course, um, which you can use. And those candy syrups can have a different impact on not only um, uh, flavor development, but also apparently mouthfeel. And you look at something like a double or a quad, uh, and both of those are darker. I do think that there's a perceptual thing that happens, just kind of this, you see this darker beer, you expect it to be more full. You expect it to have kind of more caramelly co- uh, flavors, and, and that kind of impact the way we perceive mouthfeel as well. I could be wrong about that. Um, and, and, and let's not forget, though, that there's also Belgian blonde or single, uh, which I've made many times. It's probably my favorite Belgian style, uh, Be- Belgian ale style, at least. And in that, there's always a good portion of sugar as well. You want to keep it light in body, uh, but still have that uh, and, you know, enough oomph in there to, to make it so that if you have four pints, you can't feel your toes type of thing. <laughs> yeah, and that's pretty much what happened with this beer that I brewed. Um, you know, the the original idea here was I was I was actually kind of thinking of it the other way around. I was like, you know, triples a nice a nice quenching delicious beer to have around, especially in the summer. Um, but I I was thinking more like, okay, so instead of using sugar, what happens if I use all malt? It wasn't this wasn't meant to be a, a sugar experiment in the sense that I was trying to make the beer lighter. So that I wanted I wanted to see if I was going to get more flavor from from having it be 100% malt was my original idea. And when I pitched it, everybody was like, oh yeah, sure, give it a try. <laughs> so, you know, I went, I went into it thinking like, oh, I'm going to add, I'm going to have a little more malt in this thing, um, you know, and, I'm, and consequently, maybe it'll have a little, a little more flavor and still, still obviously have the same amount of alcohol because the recipe was designed, you know, to have it be, have it be equal. So I, I actually started with the recipe with sugar and then started going towards all malt as opposed to the other way around thinking, okay, how can I, how can I dry this beer out by adding sugar? Well, the yeah. beer, the recipe already called for it. Yeah. So, you know, and, and it makes so much sense to me just on a practical level that, uh, if you take 10% of your malt and you put a, it, essentially flavorless uh, fermentable, you know, table sugar uh, in with it that it that the one with all the malt would have more flavor noticeably so uh, because, you know, that that malt is imparting more than just fermentable sugar. It's imparting all of the other stuff that is contained, you know, in in that malt and the husk and all of every little, uh, you know, thing that can be imparted. It's going to do that as a, you know, as opposed to this other one that has just the the 10% uh, sugar uh, replacing it. So it's it's an interesting thing for me to consider this, re- the, the concept of replacing a portion of malt with sugar, because it is on on many levels, at least practically speaking, uh, seems like it would um, delete an element of, uh, I guess, flavor complexity or flavor fullness. Yeah, I mean that, and that's that's what my thinking was. Just the opposite. I was thinking, all right, let's uh, let's delete the sugar. Let's put in some malt and let's undelete that, if you will. Yeah, and and add a little more flavor because I just lately I've just been on a kick where I just I love a lot of flavor in my beer. Um, that's, that's slowly changing after, you know, the, the 12 days of barley wine last month, but, uh, <laughs> shifting back towards, I'm ready for summer light beers. There you go. Um, so yeah, no, I, it, it, I think it, I think that, um, you know, a lot of people think that, okay, adding a significant amount is going to dry out the beer, um, substantially, but you know, we've, we've shown in, in several experiments that, that those differences in FG don't always equate to that, you know, that, Dry, that dryness that we talk about perceiving in a beer. Yeah. 
Yeah, you know, a couple of, couple of other things that I think about as well, particularly uh, in regards to Belgian ale, is you know these are largely yeast driven, um, uh, you know, highly characterful in terms of the fermentation character types of beers, right? So you've got uh, yeah. this kind of phenolic and ester profile in Belgian ales that really do separate them from cleaner American style or even other European style beers, um, and so uh, maybe a part of uh, using that much sugar um, in in these beers is to you want to kind of um, you know reduce that malt character a little bit a little bit so that the yeast character shines through and and it kind of got me thinking as well what impact does um, you know when when the yeast is is fermenting that more simple sugar is it producing is it more uh, you know won't to kind of produce um, these characters that are desired in those styles of beers, or does it does it produce the same character regardless of the type of sugar that it's fermenting? Um, that's you know that's one thing I, I don't know that I kind of thought about in terms of uh, Belgian ales using a lot of uh, simple sugars. Yeah, well, I mean, when we look at how, what our wort is comprised of, you know, it's I, what is it like ten percent is glucose and fructose, and then another five percent is sucrose, and then forty percent is maltose, and then we've got some other things like that. Um, you know, but when we're adding in sugar, we're essentially adding the sucrose. We're adding, you know, we're adding sucrose at the end of the boil. So we've got high heat, we've got a, a, a lower acidity environment. So we are going to, you know, we're, we are going to get some of that sugar to invert into the simple sugars of glucose and fructose. Um, so I'm not sure, you know, we're only adding 10% sugar. I'm not sure how much we're, we're changing what the yeast are eating. And, yeah. you know, in terms of when you look at how much maltose there is yeah. well, in the wort. So. Which kind of makes me think about what we talked about last week with enzymes. It, you know, can you compensate um, for the need, I guess, uh, to add sugar by just mashing really low and, and really encouraging, you know, uh, that amylase enzyme to, to, ch- you know, choppy, choppy up those, uh, <laughs> yeah. the, you know what I'm saying? Those, those starches yeah. into really more simple, uh, easily digestible sugars for the, for the yeast. Anyways, can you drive that fermentation and that FG down low enough to where, to where it would be, even if you added sugar to it, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it just another thing that was on my mind, um, in terms of, uh, in terms of using sugar and the whole, you know, since we, we've been talking about enzymes so much, but Brian, like you said, you recently completed an experiment on this very topic. And uh, we're going to be discussing that in detail as soon as we're back from this short break. When dumping wort-soaked grain and leftover low-gravity wort while cleaning up after a brew day, do you ever wonder what your true efficiency would be if that wort made its way to the kettle instead? Using the brew bag, a fabric filter for all mash tons and brewing methods, allows you to capture every last drop of wort. Not only does this increase kettle efficiency, it lowers your grain bill, which saves you money. Throwing wort in the trash is like dumping a 12-pack down the drain and just doesn't make sense. Use the brew bag and leave no wort behind. I've been using these filters for a long time and recommend them to everyone. I never have to worry about a stuck sparge and clean up is fast and easy. Go grab yourself a brew bag fabric filter at brewinabag.com and be sure to use code TBP17 at checkout to get a discount on your order. Have you ever thought about adding a port to your kettle but held off because you didn't feel like drilling into your gear or sending it off to have someone else do it? From the makers of the super fast counterflow chiller, the Exchillerator comes the Hangover. The easiest way to add extra ports to your kettle as well as countless other options. Mount a faucet to your keg for easy portable pouring. Set up the perfect whirlpool arm. Hold a heating element in place. All of this and so much more without permanently modifying your gear. Manufactured right here in the United States, The Hangover offers brewers too many convenient solutions to list here. So head over to Accelerator.com today to see what The Hangover can do for you. Compact and simple to use with a small footprint for brewing indoors, the Grainfather makes it easy for you to brew professional quality beers at home. The Grainfather is an all-in-one brewing system that lets you brew all-grain beer in a single, compact stainless steel unit. It uses an electric heating element and pump to maintain a constant temperature and to circulate the wort during the mashing and cooling stages. It also comes with a counterflow chiller to reduce chilling times and produce high-quality wort. And now, with the 
edition of their Conical Fermenter, the Grain Father takes things one step further by offering homebrewers state-of-the-art temperature-controlled fermentation just like commercial breweries use. And with the Grain Father Recipe Creator and Connect app, you can easily design a recipe, sync your brewing system with your phone, and then just sit back and relax as the app takes over and assures that you maintain your scheduled mash temps and boil schedule. Head to GrainFather.com to purchase your all-in-one brewing system today and to sign up for their free recipe creator tool. Once more, head on over to GrainFather.com. That's GrainFather.com and get started today. As we discussed earlier, using simple sugar in beer, while arguably an efficient way to increase alcohol, is a method that comes not without its share of critiques. Well, curious to see for ourselves, we put this one to the test. So as I mentioned earlier, I messaged the guys. I said, hey, I want to try making a triple. Um, I was really craving a Belgian beer. Triple is my absolute favorite. And... My idea was I wanted to replace the the uh, the sugar that's usually used with some malt, and so I went to Brew Like a Monk. Um, there's a lot of great information there on Belgian beers. I went online, I checked out a bunch of different recipes. Um, you know, and a lot of them called for small additions of Munich malt, a little bit of aromatic. Um, I think one of them called for some Vienna or something. You know, they called for different types of candy syrup, candy sugar, uh, different amounts, and what we ultimately settled on was to Make a make a triple. Let the yeast shine. Let the sugar variable be up front, um, and make a beer that was 100% Pilsner malt. Yeah. And so I used Pelton from Mecca, which is a a, a great or a great Pilsner malt um, that I thought would really do well in this style. And then I backed it off on one recipe to have 10% of the fermentables come from the sugar. So it's not, it's, not a, it's not a completely equal replacement because the target was here was to have the original gravities be the same. We didn't want that to, to mess with anything in terms, of, uh, in terms of the variable. So in the all malt recipe, I just used a straight up 16 pounds of Pelton. Um, in, the, in the recipe that was with sugar, uh, it backed it off to 13 and a quarter pounds of Pelton and I added a pound and a half of just table sugar, straight old sucrose. And so that was, that ended up being 10.2% of the total grist. Yeah. Yeah. And so one of the things now, and, and we, we didn't talk about this earlier in terms of like pros and cons of, of using sugar, the stuff that people talk about. One of the biggest concerns that I've heard about using sugar, especially like table sugar or corn sugar as a, uh, as an adjunct to some of the grain in the, in the, in, in a, in a beer recipe is that it can lead to like apple or cider like off flavors. Um, th- now this is something that I can say anecdotally in every beer that I've had that's been made with a portion of sugar, I've never experienced but par- part of my interest when you proposed this experiment idea was to see if hey you know side by side is one going to have even just a whisper more of that kind of cider like or apple character you know that's the one thing that nobody mentioned at all i mean i already talked about all the different the the esters and the you know the spiciness and all the belgian yeast characteristics that sort of thing i've served this beer to Plenty of people just for fun. We gave it away for the holidays. Everybody loved it. Nobody mentioned a thing about apple. <laughs> well, and again, you know, I, I, it, it, you did use a Belgian yeast strain, and that could be covering yeah. it up. Could be. <laughs> we gotta be. But uh, so back to the back to the brew day. You made both of these beers uh, side by side, and um, you know, you were aiming for the same OG. And it, eventually, what ended up happening was the all malt beer, the one that was made with a hundred percent Pelton Pilsner malt, uh, reached a 1070 OG, whereas the one that had the sugar uh, supplemented into it uh, for a portion of the malt was at 1072, which to me is pretty doggone close. I mean, for for a first go round of this and for using a calculator, you know, 0.002 SG difference uh, isn't that crazy. Yeah, no, it it didn't seem that too far off. I did my best, as they say. And, uh, you know, I was, you know, (laughs) two points off. uh, That's fine. If I I can brew two two all grain beers within two points of each other, I'm really happy. So... (laughs) You know, we think about all the things that go into go into making beer and all the different variables. That's I feel like that's really close, especially yeah. for the sugar. Yeah. 
So I'm going to say it's, I'm going to say it's pretty awesome. (laughs) Yeah, no, I think it is too. And did did you notice, so you pitched the same amount of yeast into both, uh, into both batches. Did you notice any differences in terms of like the fermentation, uh, behavior or any, I would think that for example, the one that had the sugar in it might've had a more, uh, like a a stronger propensity to maybe blow off or, uh, maybe the Krausen looked or, or acted differently. Well, I couldn't see them because I was using the SS brew buckets and that's, you know, I love the SS brew buckets. So I use those. Um, the only, the only thing, the only indicator to me was, you know, use, using or taking a look at the, uh, the air lock activity. They both look the same. You know, you can see in both the, uh, in the pictures on, on the website that, um, you know, both the brew buckets are completely clean. So I didn't have any blow off issues. That is one of the nice things is there's a good amount of headspace in, in yeah. those. Um, you know, I also, I tend to use Fermi cap just to make sure that I don't get blow blowovers cause it just destroys my shower area. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, everything, you know, everything everything seemed the same the uh you know until i took the uh, the final gravity measurements um but yeah fermentation was was pretty pretty straightforward for both of them so so in terms of final gravity though this i think this is interesting my expectation okay ahead of time now i already know what happened but sure. um my expectation would have been given the you know the claims that that simple sugars are 100% fermentable uh that the the beer that had the sugar added to it in the boil you added now now you added that sugar in the last 10 minutes of the boil right that is correct yes okay. last 10 minutes so last 10 minutes it's all nice and incorporated and and dissolved into the wort um and hopefully slightly inverted yeah, sure yeah <laughs> yeah but no, my, I mean, that's that, yeah that's the idea of, of adding in the last 10 minutes at least in my head was you know is, is that heat and that acidity can help help invert that sugar a little bit i don't think it does a lot but i think it does a little bit it might just be to sanitize it but you know i'll totally take your word for that uh sure. my, my expectation in terms of uh attenuation though would have been that the the batch with the sugar in it would have attenuated more just because of this 100 percent fermentability claim and sure enough, it did. Um, it, it, it actually ended up being lower than Beersmith predicted it for both beers, but the final gravity uh, was 1010 for the all malt beer. So that all malt beer went from 1070 to 1010. And then the sugar beer, or the, the portion of sugar beer, went from 1072 and it finished at 1005. So we've got a five point difference between um, the sugar and the non-sugar beer. Yeah. Yeah. That's gnarly. And, it, but it, in my opinion, it makes sense, but you, you know, you're considering the fact that the, this beer that had just straight sugar added to it, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, you got to point it out in terms of cost, that beer was effectively cheaper. Uh, you had higher OG, you had lower FG. So it also had more alcohol. I believe that 1072 to 1005 comes out to about 8.9% ABV, uh, compared to the eight point, what is it? 8.6 or 8.5% ABV for the other one, the all malt one. So not a huge difference in ABV, but you know, something to consider, uh, if you're, if you're swapping out sugar. Yeah, I think that's pretty interesting. Um, in terms of the finished beer, so you, you keg these beers up, you treat them exactly the same in the keg and, and whatnot. Um, but in terms of the finished beers, uh, any differences in terms of appearance that you recall um so when i was taking the hydrometer samples uh to do the fg the the appearance at that point was identical um i i always try my beer you know the entire way along the journey and you know i i know what you're gonna say but trying them both flat uncarbonated slightly slightly warmish the the all malt beer did taste to me to seem to have a little more body to it Hmm. and the aromas between the two seemed ever so slightly different i I felt like the sugar beer had more a slightly more banana flavor or banana aroma to it that's that's another thing that i've heard though about using sugars that it it somehow uh can can lead to um you know just a a subtle isoamyl acetate type of character um and so and and maybe on prior to being carbonated and i know that there are certain characteristics and flavors and whatnot compounds that can kind of like volatize off or blow off uh once it's carbonated and you know you're purging kegs and whatnot but uh i don't know I, i i'm taking your word for it i bet you didn't expect me to say Say that, Brian. <laughs> you were biased. I'm just going to put it that way. I know. There, we, there it is. Hang on. Blasphemy bingo. Center square. Um, <laughs> you heard it here first, folks. Brulosophy bingo. It's a thing. So, uh, so I wasn't able. I wasn't able to pick them up on the triangle test. But yeah, I mean, as I went along, I, I did feel like for the first couple of weeks, it it did seem to me like in side by sides because that's pretty much you know other than a triangle test, that's kind of the, the easiest way I could can compare them. Um, you know, and side by sides, I did feel like the all malt beer had a little more, 
a little more flavor to it. And for a while, I, it was quote unquote my favorite, um, despite still being able, still not passing any any triangle tests. So you um, so so when you put these in a triangle and you were blind to which beers were in which cup, you were unable to distinguish these beers uh, consistently in any way whatsoever. That is correct. God, bias is an interesting thing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. <laughs> We've had a lot of people actually comment on how, um, you know, pe- people, if somebody, I, I, I'm going to try to piece together this, this critique that we've received uh, quite a few times that if somebody thinks they can perceive a difference, uh, between two samples, knowing what the variable is and whatnot, that, that, that there's some validity to that. And that the triangle test just can, in some way, isn't measuring, uh, distinguishability in the same way. And I, you know, I'm scratching my head as somebody who has studied, you know, cognitive bias and, and logical fallacies as a freaking profession you know i'm looking at this going yeah i don't think they get it but but you know it is what it is believe what you want belief you know serves a purpose in many realms so yeah and it is a different test than you know well people will say okay well serve me two beers that are side by side um you know and don't tell me what they are or what happened you know think about it if i was to mix them up so i don't know which one i'm tasting you well know, that sort of thing elaborate elaborate on that because i think a lot of people have confusions and, and you're you're much more well spoken in, in this realm of things than i am um, but elaborate on you know elaborate on the the blind the blind tasting with just two cups well yeah if you if i were to serve you and i've done this many times i'm a jerk man i'm, I'm the friend that people you know never trust basically uh when it comes to tasting beer at the very least but if i if i were to take for example uh um, um, to what when I think of a really characterful characterful beer uh, commercial beer that everyone kind of knows the flavor I think of fat tire it tastes like you know biscuits right but if right. I take I could take two pints of fat tire beer set them right in front of somebody and and tell them hey w- this one is fat tire uh, one of these is fat tire the other one is uh, Sam Adams Boston Boston lager it looks kind of the same tastes totally different right and I guarantee you if when I do that the one the one that I say is Sam Adams Boston lager is not going to get described as being biscuits it's not going to get it's just because the way our brains organize information and we have to rely on this isn't a diss i wish people would understand that but we have to rely on what we think we know in order to keep that information organized and and kind of box it up so that we're not overworking our mind when it comes to perceiving these things that's all i'm saying so if i know that one of these beers has sugar in it and in my box of knowledge about using sugar that can lead because somebody said so can lead to a cidery character I'm probably more uh, likely to experience a cidery character in this beer if I know that it has sugar in it. Um, and that's just the way our, our minds work. And there's nothing wrong with that. But that's what the triangle test aims to kind of suspend. Great. Thank you. Did that, was, that do it? Did I, that do it for you, Brian? Is that, is that well, what you're looking I, I, for? Not for me. I just for the just for the listeners out there, because I think some people are are confused as to, occasionally as to why using a triangle test. Why why can't I just do a side by side? Yeah, know, those sorts of things. So I think I think that I just wanted you to explain it because I don't want to butcher it all up. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, so I, I I did a lot of side by side, you know, trying to mix them up and that sort of thing, and then that's. You know, you, you, you hit the nail on the head because what I was looking for and what was going through my head was I'm looking for the one that seems like it has more body, exactly. more body, exactly. more body, you know, that sort of thing. So right. anyhow, bottom line is I couldn't tell the difference between them, um, you know, especially, and I felt like even that, even that side by side that I was looking for, I felt like that actually got harder the longer the beer is um, conditioned. Sure. Um, and, you know, so I, at that point it was time to take it to the people. So... <laughs> I, uh, I invited everybody I knew to uh, come over and uh, or actually, no, I took the, I took this one to a, to a brew club meeting and uh, brought it down. I got 22 people to, uh, to participate and to have this come back with some sort of statistical significance, 12 people would have to have identified the odd beer out. However, only six, which is right about probability slightly under actually yeah, um, yeah indicating that you know people were not able to uh reliably distinguish this triple that was made with 10 percent sugar versus 100 percent malt yeah uh and i'll be honest with you i i thought this was going to be this you know and i we sometimes we say this sometimes our expectations are completely upheld in this one they weren't for me um i fully expected the all malt beer i i, I didn't have any concerns about the sugar beer, the one that had the sugar in it. I didn't actually think it was going to lead to a uh, uh, apple flavor or even isoamyl acetate, that banana flavor or anything like that. What I did think though, uh, was that the all malt beer was going to be more malty, bready, uh, maybe, uh, you know, th- a little bit thicker mouthfeel type of thing. Six out of 22 people that just, just 
for those out there who want a percentage, that's 27% of the participants. When you've got three beers to choose from, if you're randomly guessing, the expectation is that 33% will choose each beer if they're all identical. Um, in this case, you know, 27%, uh, that's just, I feel comfortable saying that there was no real perceptible difference between these beers in terms of flavor, which in this case uh, is pretty mind blowing, seeing as there was an obvious, very objectively measurable difference between these beers in terms of not only OGFG, but, but alcohol level. Yeah, I completely agree. I I was surprised. I was mostly surprised that I was unable to um, identify in a triangle test, just knowing what the variable was. And because I feel like when we're looking for it, when we're looking for something that we can objectively measure, um, you know, it does make it easier for us as as tasters or as yeah. exper- experimenters or junior brewlosophers or whatever whatever you want to call it. <laughs> assistant you know? to the assistant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, it makes it easier because it's like, okay, I know what I'm looking for. I know the style. I know what I did. Um, that's the and, purpose of and, blindness, right? I mean, and, that, right. and we aim to keep people as blind as possible. I will say, and we've got experiments set to plan the, uh, planned out to test this out, but, um, we, I'm starting to question the importance of blindness when it comes to these tests. I, I, for this started with somebody t- pointing out to me one time, wouldn't it be good if, uh, you guys let the people know what the difference was so that they could focus on what the difference is and, and might that allow them to taste the difference? Because, if, if it does, then that still says that there may be something different about these beers if they don't know which one is in which cup. I don't know. It makes sense to me. And uh, in my own kind of side trials with leftover experiment beers, I'll, I'll be honest, the findings have been pretty interesting. So uh, that, that, that's coming in the future. Um, as far as these specific results go, uh, what kind of implications can you kind of extract from this data? I can save a couple bucks on my um, brewing by just adding sugar is the, <laughs> is the straight up one. So you're going to um, swap out one of your bulk bins with just a, a bunch of, uh, you know, sugar beet sugar? Yeah, I'm going to have a Vittle vault just full of uh, organic <laughs> Costco sugar or whatever, cheap Costco sugar. Yeah, the sugar yeah. beet. I lived next to a um, sugar beet factory in, in Idaho for a couple of years. And, I'm sorry. Uh, I, yeah, it was so, dude, the smell is, uh, my, my wife and I, we, we were, you know, we weren't married then, but the smell is like burnt peanuts. Like if you were to take peanuts yeah. and throw it in a, and it's crazy stuff, but yeah, sugar beets, uh, cane sugar, those are, those are basically the same thing. It's ultimately the yeah. same compound. So, I mean, implications on this specific experiment, you, you know, if you want to add some sugar, um, and replace it with some of your malt, you can probably get away with it or potentially get away with it. Um, without having a huge effect and maybe just, you know, get your house guests a little drunker. Uh, but I mean, I mean, we didn't, there wasn't a tremendous amount of sugar used here. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't replace more than, more than, you know, 10% or something like that, but. Or do it and uh, let us know how it turns out. I mean, I'm, yeah, you know, I'm, the, I, I, that, the thing is, is I like, this is, you're right. This is good news for people who may, maybe want to, you know, pinch a few pennies and, and not spend some, but at the same time, I mean, I, I don't plan to start integrating a bunch of sugar use. No, nope. uh, I'll continue using it the way I do when I make Belgian ales. Um, I do think that, uh, swapping out a portion, a good portion actually of the, of the grist for things like light lager, uh, with some corn sugar or even table sugar, whatever it is, I think that can really help to drive that, uh, that, that impression of dryness without adding flavor. And I think that's pretty cool. But, uh, yeah, so I, I, you know, this, these, these results kind of, yeah, I, I like them. I think that I mean, th- I mean, I think some of the positive, more serious implications, I guess, would just be that you know you don't have to worry about these these off flavors uh, or lack of malt or you know apple cidery or boozy yeah. or watery thin, you know those sorts of things. I mean, if you think about it in the reverse of the way I thought about it. And the concerns of, okay, well, maybe if I add sugar to a beer, I'm going to be, I'm going to be making it thinner or not as, not as, uh, flavorful or, yeah. or there might be off flavors. Those concerns, I think, I think, I think what this does is it, it, it kind of relieves me of some of those concerns as opposed to, you know, my joke early of just like, let's, you know, a little more booze for your buck. But, yeah. Or, you know, if you've got, you know, if you're, if you're constricted by mash ton size, but you still want to do a higher alcohol beer, you know, you might look into, um, you know, doing as much malt as you can and then adding some additional sugar, um, you know, and you might be able to get away with a little bit of it before your beer, t- you know, might taste different. I, no, know. no, I think that's, I think that's a perfect implication is, is, Hey, listen, you know, I can get up to, you know, 1075 using my gear now, but if I, if I just toss in, you know, from my, from my mash, but if I can just toss in two pounds of sugar, uh, into this, uh, barley wine or, or, or Russian Imperial stout or something like that, I can get it up to that 1100, you know, mark and, and, uh, 
potentially not have a huge impact on the ultimate carrier character of the beer. I think it's really cool. Um, now we're coming up on the end of the show and, and we're going to start integrating these reader comments. I'm going to read them, Brian, because I'm sure that you just ignored them uh, when the article was dropped. Uh, this first comment I comes have from a very busy life. I'm just going to say, yeah. Oh yeah. We all do. Don't <laughs> I we? try. I try to get every comment. If I don't get to you, I'm really sorry, but I will get to you eventually. Yeah. And we will, uh, we will be reading these comments and uh, giving some responses on, on every episode from this point forward. So uh, the first one comes from uh, user ET4117 on Reddit. He says, after I, li- or he or she says, after I listened to your podcast on brewing with sugar, I became interested in doing just that. Since then, I've made beers with Belgian candy syrups and rock sugar, as well as just plain brown and white sugar with great results. I found that my brews with simple sugars tend to need a little extra time to develop than uh, some of my pure grain beers of similar SGFG, uh, but I haven't done any experimentation to back that up. Interesting comment uh, about the requ- the these beers requiring a little bit more time to uh, mature than all malt beers. Yeah, I kind of wonder what he means by develop. I wonder if there's if he's talking about some. I wonder if by you know you you mentioned by knowing what you're doing, you have this this bias in your head. You know, I wonder if he's thinking that all right by adding sugar, I'm gonna I'm getting this more of an alcoholic flavor, and that just needs more time to mellow. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's it's. I, I appreciate the feedback. It's a little vague on what he means by extra time to develop. Um, you know, I, I as as I went through tasting both these beers side by side, you know, I told you that I felt like they did taste a little different, um, but I don't know if one felt less developed than the other one did. Yeah, my mind automatically goes to just the higher ABV aspect of it. Um, yeah. You know, you're commonly here that that beers that have a high ABV, pretty much anything north of about nine percent, um, that that you know they can take some time for that alcohol component to kind of mellow out. So I'm assuming maybe that's that's what he's referring to. Um, but it could also be bias as well. I don't know. Uh, next comment comes from funny fat guy on, on Reddit. <laughs> that's That sounds like basically the entire Brewlosophy crew. Um, that's just funny. Hey, whoa. whoa. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. I didn't mean to judge you, Brian. Uh, but, but funny fat guy says, I've been hesitant to use regular sugar in the brew process because it just felt wrong. Uh, but this has me believing it's okay at $2 for four pounds. It's cheap cheaper than corn sugar, which I bought at $2 for two pounds. So he's making the distinction between table sugar and corn sugar. And uh, I, I mean, I agree with him. I've got, I can't remember the last time I used corn sugar and not table sugar in a beer. Yeah, I'm straight up all table sugar right now. I mean, uh, you know, corn, corn sugar is just glucose or dextrose or, you know, it's very, very simple sugar. Whereas, you know, the sucrose, as you guys mentioned in the, the sugar episode is made up of Gluc is you know a disaccharide that's made up of both glucose and fructose, um, but you know through through heat it can invert and break down into the glucose the glucose and the fructose molecules, um, or yeast has an enzyme in it that actually you know it slowly can it can it there's I read an explanation about this years ago about how the way that it works with the cell wall but it uses an enzyme to break down that sucrose before it ingests the fructose and the glucose then ferments it out. So you're good either way. Yeah. 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 I, I, I just stick with table sugar because for one, um, you know, my wife uses it in baking and coffee. And so it's always around, uh, but it also is a bit cheaper. So yeah, way to yeah. be funny fat guy. Uh, David <laughs> Stelting commented uh, on the website that he'd like to see the preference data on this one, which we don't usually share when experiments fail to achieve significance. But uh, I looked it up just for you, David. Three of the correct tasters uh, prefer, this is three out of six, preferred the beer with sugar added to it. One liked the all malt beer more or said that they liked it more. And the the other two didn't have a preference despite saying that they noticed a difference. So there you have it. Uh, I don't think that's very groundbreaking seeing as uh, most people just couldn't distinguish these beers. But uh, Jared Bradley uh, left a comment on the article. He says, how does the presence of sugar drive the FG down to 1005? Doesn't that mean sugar is making the yeast eat more of the malt sugars as well? Uh, that has never made sense to me. Maybe I'm missing something. I think what he's I think what he's curious about is why why does the sugar beer end up with a lower F, lower final gravity? We touched on that earlier, and it's because that the sugar is 100 percent fermentable, so we don't have any residual sweetness or residual residual unfermentable sugars to contribute to those FG points. And in addition, right. you know, we are ending up with more alcohol, and alcohol itself has what is I think alcohol has a S or a specific gravity. Uh, it's like 0.79 or something like that. I want to say. So I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, because I, I remember looking it up when we did the Q and A for uh, number four or five, but 
Um, so we've got alcohol that also has a lower specific gravity. So when it's mixed in with the rest of the beer, it's also bringing those gravity points down a few yeah. more. So that's why you, you would expect, and Beersmith predicts it as well, that yeah, anytime you add sugar, you're going to end up with, you know, we say it a slightly drier beer, but we'll just say um, objectively it's lower a lower final gravity. Yeah. And the way I like to think about it, I think uh, simply is that uh, that sugar is 100% fermentable effectively. And uh, so it's going to leave more alcohol, which is going to thin out the beer. And and when you think of specific gravity, it's a measure of the density of a liquid and uh, the the density of a beer that has more alcohol in it, um, all other things being equal, at least um, it, it's going to be less dense. And that's why you get a lower SG. So um, uh, thanks for the comment, Jared. Uh, final comment we got from John Blackthorne on Facebook. He says, I I think the fact that the one brewed with sugar in the boil finished with a higher ABV and lower FG than the all malt batch is proof enough. It's exactly the effect Belgian brewers are trying to achieve. Uh, had this experiment been done with a quad, I think the tasting panel would have had a much different opinion. Um, I, I found this comment a little bit confusing. I, I, I guess what I'm curious about is what he thinks the how, how he thinks the opinion would have been different. Yeah, well. I think the, fir- the first thing I actually want to go to is when he says is proof enough. And yes, objectively, sure, there, there's proof in the pudding. If you are objectively measuring with an instrument, um, these beers, there is a difference. Yeah. However, our instrument, as we've discussed numerous times, is the human palate. And, you know, we, we didn't really prove anything, but we did show in this particular example that the human palate is unable to distinguish the difference. Yeah. Um, looking at the quad, um, I do believe that I, I know quads use a uh, much more sugar than um, than a triple would, and oftentimes it's a darker candy sugar. Yeah. So I do think, yeah, I, I would agree with John on this. That yes, if you if you brewed a quad with a hundred percent just all malt, all Pilsner malt, and you did one with Pilsner malt and then substituted dark Belgian candy sugar uh, for a large percentage. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I do think that there would have been a very different opinion. Yeah. If he, if he's just talking about a stronger beer, um, you know, where we're just dumping in table sugar, you know, maybe we're doing a, the same experiment, but we're using 20 or 30%, you know, yeah, I, they they might have. There's no way to tell. I, I do think. Yeah, you, sure. If you if you brew a completely different style and you do something that's that drastic, I right. would think that you'd be able to tell a difference. No, okay, that um, makes sense because quad is a more. Uh, it, again, like you said, they're using darker, um, uh, you know, sugar syrups basically that do in part flavors and well uh, you know ostensibly um so if if what he is saying is that you've got an all pilsner malt versus you know pilsner malt with uh you know 15 to 20 percent dark candy sugar then yeah i agree i think people would have a different opinion on that but the fact that you did a triple where it was a you know arguably flavorless sugar addition replacing some of the malt uh isn't as surprising that maybe people couldn't taste the difference okay i think that's Perhaps yeah, what he's fair talking enough. about. Yeah, fair enough. Well, uh, Brian, that is all the time we've got. I kind of like this new approach. There's something I about digging a little deeper into single experiments. It's kind of fun. Yeah, I think it's great. It's, it's fun to go back and, and kind of reanalyze the thought process. And, you know, just like I was talking about the all malt versus the sugar, me thinking the whole thing about malt and everybody else is probably thinking about the sugar side of it. And yeah, yeah. It's fun to go back and take a look at all this and the comments that people have. And, and the, you know, it'll be really fun to see next week what the feedback is on some of the things that we said as well definitely definitely well please let us know what you think uh you can do that via email or by leaving a review wherever it is you listen to podcasts or on our social media we do read those and take them to heart you might even get your comment uh read live here on the show so uh to read about the experiment discussed in this episode or any of the other stuff we're up to you can head over to brewlosophy.com the brewlosophy podcast is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors as well as all of our rad listeners we seriously could not do this without you cheers to everyone who has subscribed and left a review of our show it makes a huge difference if you haven't yet please consider doing so head over to brewlosophy.com support to view a list of ways you can easily help us to continue producing this podcast if you want a reward for your support visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy thanks again for listening we'll be back next week with another episode of the brewlosophy podcast until then think beer Start off the morning with some hot tea, lemon and honey, cause it suits my bro. Put some herb in the bowl, yeah, it's homegrown. Ain't gotta go through the middle man no more.